We are now on the second fruit in our series on the fruit of the Spirit, uh, as the Apostle Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit simply, um, you know, if, if we really believe that we have new identity in Jesus Christ, we have new life in Christ, then that new life takes on a, a, a certain tone, a character. And so the Apostle Paul describes that tone as being uh, this fruit of the Spirit, uh, which we have the opportunity to take a close look at each and every one of those over the next several weeks. We, we explored love uh, last week, and this Sunday we get to take a look at joy. And so in order for us to get a better picture of, of joy and what that, what that means and how we see it and how we experience it, um, I've chosen as our passage this morning that well-known book I'm sure you've all turned to in the last couple days, Nehemiah. Um, and so I will, uh, I will read from several verses from Nehemiah um, right now. I invite you to hear the word of God to your life. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate, and they told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people when he opened it. All the people stood up. And then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so, so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of, the, of them to those who, who nothing is prepared for this day, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for the joy of gathering as your people and as we move through our worship this morning in all of our singing and thinking, reflecting and praying, and all of the burdens and anxieties and fears and questions and joys and sorrows that we bring with us, we pray that you would meet us wherever we need to be met, that you would lift our spirits, that you would remind us in new ways of who you are and who we are as your people. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. There is an ancient Egyptian myth which says that after death, every individual is confronted with two questions which have to be answered honestly. The first question, did you find joy? And the second question, did you bring joy? G.K. Chesterton once said that joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian. C.S. Lewis put it this way, joy is the serious business of heaven. Dorothy Sayers said the only real sin a Christian can commit is to be joyless. Brother Lawrence said it like this, joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. Frederick Buechner observed, astonishment and joy are what our faith finally point to. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Calcutta, India, a city commonly referred to as the city of joy, and it lived up to its description. The majority of the people there live in extreme poverty. If you're lucky enough, you have a house made up of a cardboard box. 
It was the filthiest and most chaotic city I've ever been to. While there, I had the chance to work in a Christian school, a Christian school that was designated for the poorest of the poor children. The poorer you were, the better chance you had to get into the school. And there was an unmistakable joy, for whatever reason, that permeated, that filled the atmosphere of this place, this school, where they had very little reason, if any at all, to be joyful. People found joy in simply being alive. In fact, wherever, whenever I've had um, the opportunity to go on a mission trip to Guatemala or El Salvador or Romania or other places where economic instability was the overwhelming issue, for whatever reason, joy seemed to be the strongest. Our Old Testament lesson from Nehemiah tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength. What a great affirmation, isn't that? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, I'm going to assume that, indeed, not many of us turn to the book of Nehemiah on a regular basis, or perhaps have ever turned there. Nehemiah voiced this phrase, these words, under some remarkable circumstances. Jerusalem had been destroyed under the Babylonians in five. 86 BC. The temple was destroyed. The walls of the city were were torn down. The gates burned. Thousands of people were transported to Babylon as captives and slaves. A generation passed and then another generation. As time went on, children and grandchildren of these slaves and captives rose to positions of responsibility in Persia. And one of them was a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah had spent all of his life in Babylon, but his heart belonged to Jerusalem. He had never been there, but he had heard the stories of his people. And when he learned that Jerusalem still lay in ruins, his heart grieved, and he asked the king of of Persia, to whom he served as a cupbearer, for permission to go back to Jerusalem, along with some others, to rebuild the walls. And the king granted his permission and appointed appointed Nehemiah governor. And this amazing story of Nehemiah's return with the exiles and how they remarkably rebuilt the walls in 52 days and the obstacles and opposition they overcame in the process are recorded in the first seven chapters of this book. And by the time of today's text, the work is complete. And now it is time to worship. And chapter 8 begins with all the people gathered in the square and Ezra, the priest, brings out the five scrolls of the law of Moses And he stands on a high wooden platform built especially for this occasion. And he opens the scrolls and he begins begins reading and the people all stand. And they remain standing while Ezra reads aloud from daybreak until noon. Now to think, most of us get a little antsy after just an hour of worship. This is several hours. And all the people listen attentively and they weep as Ezra reads. When he is finished, Ezra praises the Lord and all the people raise their hands and respond, Amen, Amen. And then they bow their faces to the ground and worship the Lord. And then we come to this wonderful phrase. Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites who are helping them say to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. And then Nehemiah adds, Go, enjoy great food and sweet wine and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not grieve, says Nehemiah, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is a difficult thing to understand. Perhaps it's not our job, though, to totally understand it. Maybe joy is best understood when it is lived, when it is experienced. For many of us, it would probably hold a certain sense of being fully alive. Our society puts out the message that joy comes from certain things like a new house or a new car or the right vacation or the latest iPhone. All great things and things which certainly can bring us happiness but not necessarily capable of bringing us joy because happiness is temporary. Joy is not. We can attain happiness on our own for the most part because it is a result of our own efforts. Joy, on the other hand, is something I don't believe we can really take credit for. 
We sometimes find it in certain moments or experiences or relationships where we see, where we sense that something beyond us is at work and alive. Perhaps we have known joy in the birth of a child or the raising of a child. Can many things bring us more joy than our child greeting us with excitement? Hi, Mommy. Hi, Daddy. Or to hear a child's pure belly laugh. Many of us have known joy in marriage. Maybe we've known joy in a new friendship or in an old friendship. Being reunited with, reunited with family, perhaps. Maybe we found or find joy in our specific work. A trip to the mountains or to the beach in helping others. Or maybe we experience joy in worship. Maybe we have even known joy through some of the deepest pain in our lives because all we had at the time was to hang on to the love of God. That was the only thing we had. We certainly feel joy at times, but it's more than a feeling, isn't it? Sometimes joy can be too good to be true. It's, it's excessive and overflowing. It challenges us to open up to something bigger going on around us. And perhaps a better way of gauging when we experience joy is to ask the question, what is the joy of the Lord of which Nehemiah speaks? Is it the fuel that drives the engine of our worshiping hearts? Is it God's grace growing in us as we grow in our faith in God? Is it simply walking through each day, each day knowing that we belong to God? Why does Nehemiah speak this loaded phrase, in front of these people who are starving for restoration. They want nothing more than healing and to know that God is there with them. Because the joy he speaks of is fed and grown and shaped in the context of worshiping God. These people begin to weep over the experience of hearing God's word again because in the heart of those words is the promise that the that the Lord's power is also the strength of joy. Where there is justice, there is joy. Where there is unity, there is joy. Where there is newness of life, there is joy. And all of these things are happening in this moment, in this worship experience. As we look at the story, we discover that after reconstruction, there is also need for re-instruction. That is, after we have been in those, those empty places, in those stagnant seasons, in those dry spells, after we have been in exile, all of us need to learn or relearn how to see life from God's perspective. We need to change the way we think about ourselves, change the way we, we think about life, and we need to change the way we maybe think about worship. And if there's one ingredient, one characteristic that ought to shape any kind of worship of God, at any time, in any place, is it not joy? Nehemiah shows us that there is no substitute. There's absolutely no substitute for God's people gathering together in worship. As someone has said, there are many things we can do on our own. But being a Christian is not one of them. And this story also shows us what worship might look like if we approached worship, if we approached it as these people did. There's a writer, one of my favorite writers, Annie Dillard, who colorfully describes in one of her books what this might look like. I love what she says about worship. She says, does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of, <clears throat> what sort of power we so blithely invoke? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should, is should issue life, life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. We may do well with expressing the friendliness and hospitality of God through our worship, but do we work equally hard to convey the, the holiness of God? the mystery of God, the, the surprises of God, and even the joy of God in our worship? 
Nehemiah clues us in how worship renovates and reorients and changes people's lives, or at least it should. And after Ezra completes the reading of the Torah, the people weep. They weep. And why is that? Maybe they are overcome with regret over the loss of God's word during exile. Perhaps they have been reminded of how, how short they have come um, when it comes to God's expectations. Or maybe they are tears of joy for some, for the reminder of God's providential care. You see, God's word, scripture, this book, can spark tears for all those reasons. Because it gives us a lens through which we can see this world and our lives through God's eyes. Scripture reminds us of God's presence when we might otherwise feel alone and abandoned. We are convicted when we might otherwise feel self-satisfied or arrogant. We are assured in Scripture of God's mercy when we might otherwise keep finding ways to believe that God's patience will run out with us. And what essentially happens is that Nehemiah urges us to meet God anew in the changing times in which we find ourselves. And make no mistake, we live in a world where everything is changing, where Christianity, having once offered a very distinct and unique perspective, now blends somewhat quietly with other religious traditions. It is no longer the visible center by which our lives are either defined or, or determined. So what is it that visibly marks our lives as Christians, that sets us apart as embodying the truth, the transforming truth of Jesus Christ? At the end of the day, is it not joy? And what does it mean to embody it? I think for starters, it means knowing that we are created for it and that our joy is absolutely inseparable from our salvation. We are constantly being stretched and tested to accommodate more joy. We are repeatedly called to rejoice in the God in whose image we have been made and in whose grace we have been remade. And when we gather together as God's people, when we center our worship on who God is and not simply on what we want, we rediscover the power of Nehemiah's words. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If, if joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian, if it really is the serious business of heaven, if indeed the only real sin a Christian can commit is to be joyless, if joy is the surest sign of God's presence. If it is what our faith finally points to, then may it be where our greatest strength lies. Friends, the joy of the Lord is our strength now and always. And nothing, absolutely nothing, can ever change that. Amen.